Namaste. This Upanishad is so wonderful. This Brihadaranyaka. It is giving the deepest secrets of life. And yet, how many people ever read it? How many people study it carefully? And especially, how many people write detailed commentaries and studies of it, like Shankaracharya? I mean, really, you can count them on your fingers. So this level of knowledge is actually not meant for a wide audience. That's literally the meaning of esoteric, is that it's only meaningful or understandable by a select few, a very limited audience. And that's right there in its name, Aranyaka. Aranya means forest, and Ka means in. So this knowledge is supposed to be transferred to very renounced, very pure students only in an atmosphere of complete renunciation and austerity in the forest under the direction of a personal guru, a realized teacher. But since it's very difficult to create those conditions today, here we are giving this same knowledge <laughs> publicly on the internet. And of course, many people tune in and watch a little bit and then go on their way. But the few who really need this knowledge, where it's cutting edge of their spiritual growth and personal evolution, can get it. Because today, those schools in the forests have all broken down. Um, everybody's moved into town and opened an ashram, <laughs> which these days are more like hotels. You have to pay for a room. You don't really have a personal connection with the teacher. I mean, maybe in some of the smaller organizations, but in the by and large, in the big spiritual groups, you never even meet the guru. He's off somewhere on top of some administrative pyramid, and you only get to meet, you know, the flunkies. <laughs> Sad state of affairs in spiritual life and community in these days in Kali Yuga. So what have we got from this so far, this seventh verse of the fourth chapter, third section of Brihadaranyakapanishad? That the intelligence and the self are almost universally identified because the intelligence is that which distinguishes one thing from another, viveka, or discrimination. And the self, being the closest thing to the intelligence, lights it from within, illuminates it so that we can perceive it. Because the intelligence is very subtle. And without the light of the self, well, it wouldn't be anything. <laughs> but especially, there wouldn't be the intelligence that allows us to see this is this and this is that. So the self and the intelligence are often identified, almost universally, in fact. And since the intelligence is seated in the heart, they identify the intelligence with God or with the life energy or with the body. So this is the mistake. This is the error that ruins everything for most people. And there's only a very, very small group of people who can actually, in fact, I mean, practically in everyday life, see the difference between the self and the intellect. And how is that? Well, Shankara has been explaining a long simile that is a discussion about the revealer and the revealed. 
the light, and that which is illuminated. So he's saying that intelligence illuminates everything. So even if you have a self-illuminated object like a lamp, it is still the intelligence that illuminates it and allows it to be perceived as a lamp. And he makes a distinction between a pot and a lamp. The pot cannot be perceived in the dark. But if some lamp comes, then the pot can be seen. So the lamp reveals the pot. But the lamp is self-illuminated. Therefore, you can say, can't you, that it reveals itself? Well, no. No. Because the light of the lamp is material. It's temporary. It's conditional. It's dependent on circumstances. You have to have a lamp. You have to have a wick. You have to have oil. You have to have a match. You see? Whereas the light of the self that reveals the lamp for what it is, is always on. It's unconditional. That's the difference. The light of the self that illuminates the intelligence then illuminates everything else. And the example has been given that, for example, when you put a gem in milk, if the gem then makes the milk look colored, like a, if it was an emerald, if the milk then seems to be green, it's a real gem. Otherwise, it's fake. This is one of the tests that gemologists use for a purity of a jewel. So if that is true, then the light of the intelligence then lights up everything, just like the sun comes up at dawn and illuminates everything that was before merged in darkness. So some philosophers then try to argue that it's the intelligence that is the light in the heart. And then he brings up the argument, the simile of the lamp, and shows that even if the intelligence is luminous, self-luminous, it is still the light of the self that reveals it through consciousness. So if we weren't conscious of the intellect, doesn't matter how brightly it's self-illumined, it won't make any difference for us. And the key here is making a difference. For example, in the, in the example of the pot and the lamp, the pot is invisible until the lamp is brought because the lamp illuminates the pot, allowing it to be seen. But in the case of the lamp, the intelligence is the light that enables the lamp, even though it illuminates itself, the intelligence allows the lamp to be seen for what it is. It's not a pot, it's a lamp. Even though there might be a pot as part of the lamp that holds the butter or other oil or other fuel, it's still not going to be revealed as a lamp until the intelligence looks at it and says, oh, that's not a pot, it's a lamp. So in the same way, even if the intelligence is self-illumined, which of course it's not, <laughs> it's simply reflecting the light of the self, but even if it was self-illumined, it would take the light of the self, which is consciousness, which is existence itself, to reveal the existence of the intelligence. Because of the close relationship between the self and the intelligence, they are often confused. Most often, <laughs> they are confused. And so, as we left off last time, the self and the intellect are assumed to be identical. They're mistaken for one another. So then let's go on from there. Therefore, it, the self, cannot be taken apart from anything else, 
like a stalk of grass from its sheath and shown in its self-effulgent form. It is for this reason that the whole world, to its utter delusion, superimposes all activities peculiar to name and form on the self, and all attributes of this self-effulgent light on name and form, and also superimposes name and form on the light of the self, and thinks, this is the self, or is not the self. It has such and such attributes, or has not such and such attributes. It is the agent, or is not the agent. It is pure or impure. It is bound or free. It is fixed or gone or come. It exists or does not exist, and so on. Therefore, assuming the likeness of the intellect, this is a quote from the verse, verse 7, it moves alternately between the two worlds, this one and the next, the one that has been attained and the one that is to be attained, by successively discarding the body and organs already possessed and taking new ones, hundreds of them, in an unbroken series. So now this gets into the process of transmigration. How does the individual move from one body to another? It's by the movement of the intellect because the intellect is also the seat of desires. The heart, as is well known, is full of all kinds of desires. And so, because of these desires, and because of the confabulation of the self and the intellect, one identifies the, not only the intellect with the self, but, you know, more or less everything. And we think that the things we perceive through the intellect and mind and senses are therefore real. But they're not real because it's very easily shown that they're temporary. And if they're temporary, they cannot be absolutely real. Or if they change, they can't be absolutely real. Only the self, the actual self, <laughs> and not the self, not the mistake of identifying the intellect with the self, only the self is absolutely real because it never changes. It never turns off. <laughs> Even when it apparently turns off because the intellect, for example, goes to sleep or goes into a dream. Now, this is a special situation. When the intellect goes into a dream, and the next few verses are going to discuss this in great detail. But actually what happens is it goes into a state between this world, in other words, the world, the environment that we currently inhabit by identification with a body in this world, and the next world or the world that we will inhabit in a future life. And by taking a body in that world after the demise of the present body, we will shift from one to another. But now, in the meantime, when we dream, what we're seeing is the impressions of our life today superimposed on the consciousness, then stitched together by the intelligence to form an impression of a future life. This is revolutionary because it gives us a way to diagnose our spiritual progress through dreams. See, this is the one, one of the things that's not obvious from the text. Uh, another thing that's not obvious from the text, but which certainly can be deduced from it, is that one should meditate on the heart. Because if the self is identified with intelligence and intelligence is seated in the heart, that means the road to the self is through the heart. And we find in practice, when we meditate on the heart, all kinds of wonderful spaces open up. So this is a practice that we should derive from these passages, that we should meditate on the heart with 
the objective of discriminating between the mind, intelligence, and the self. So this is a bit tricky, as we discussed last time. Uh, it's sort of like walking on your own feet. Because if the intelligence is what is used to discriminate between different things, in other words, tell the difference between them, then if the intelligence is trying to find the difference between itself and the self, and the intelligence is identified with the self, it's going to feel like it's trying to cut itself in two or something like that. It's going to feel very weird. So there's a very, very simple heuristic that allows us to tell the difference. That is, intelligence is not conscious all by itself. Even though it appears to be, it's just like the lamp and the pot. The pot is like the mind. The lamp is like the intelligence. So the intelligence may illuminate the mind, but even though the intelligence appears to be self-luminous, that is only because of its identification with the self. And as soon as we disidentify the intelligence, we come to the self alone. And in the self alone, there is no perception. Why? No intelligence. No mind, no senses, no world. The self is only awareness. It's not consciousness. Consciousness comes with duality. When you make a distinction between the knower and the known, the seer and the seen. So lacking this distinction, because remember, distinctions are made by intelligence. So if intelligence becomes dormant or inert or inactive, then consciousness also collapses. That means the experience of the self is that of non-perception. And Buddha talks about this also in the highest jhana, or meditative state. He calls it neither perception nor non-perception. That's a tricky name, but what it means is that when we're in that state, we do not perceive anything, but we are still perceptic. In other words, capable of perception. But because there is nothing in the void, in sushupti, we don't perceive anything. So that leads us to wonder whether we can perceive anything or not. But actually, we can perceive. It's just that there are no objects. The fact that we know that we exist in that state means that we are perceptive. We are aware. We're aware of ourself. We're aware of being aware. And this is Turiya. This is Brahman. So we can realize Brahman through this succession of denials. Neti, neti, neti. Huh? This is not it. This is not it. This is not it. On and on until there's literally nothing left. That's the reality. And the fact that we perceive that there is nothing left is the proof that we exist and are perceptic. Therefore, the self is the light that reveals everything when it gets broadcast to the intelligence, the mind, the, org the sense organs, the body, the world, etc., etc. We see all these phenomena as existent. Because the self is existent. Just like we see the pot as being illuminated because the lamp is illuminate. If the lamp is illuminate and the self is illuminate, then they illumine everything else. And everything else comes into view only because of them. So remember, this is a simile. The lamp and the pot are similar to the self and the intelligence. Actually, the intelligence is inert. It's just a machine. It only functions in the presence of the self when the self is there to illumine it. Otherwise, like the pot in the dark, it may exist. It may be there, but we can't perceive it. So in this way, 
we are building up a view of the differences between the self and everything else. Even though in practice, in life, most people confabulate the self and, well, basically everything. <laughs> we are starting to be able to distinguish the self from everything else. And that is jnana yoga. That is the pinnacle of self-realization. So this is like, you know, it's like building a muscle, lifting weights or something, you know, and building up your strength in a particular muscle. And this particular muscle is the one that allows us to distinguish the self. This movement between the two worlds is merely due to its resembling the intellect, not natural to it. That it is attributable to its resembling the limiting adjuncts of name and form created by a confusion and is not natural to it is being stated because assuming the likeness of the intellect, it moves alternately between the two worlds. The text goes on to show that this is a fact of experience. It thinks as it were. By illumining the intellect, which does the thinking, through its own self-effulgent light that pervades the intellect, the self assumes the likeness of the latter and seems to think, just as light looks colored. Hence, people mistake that the self thinks, but really it does not. Likewise, it shakes as it were. When the intellect and other organs, as well as the pranas, move, the self, which illumines them, becomes like them, and therefore seems to move rapidly. But really, the light of the self has no motion. The self is a static. Not ecstatic, a static. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's not an agent. It's not a cause. Neither is it an object or an effect. The self simply is, and its unlimitedly existent, sat, means always present, and chit, always aware, and ananda, always blissful. So, by means of meditation on the heart, we can realize that we are the self, and not the intellect or the mind or anything else. And we can come to this conclusion by experience, by direct knowledge. Even though the self appears to move, it appears to move between one world and another, between one state of consciousness and another, and shakes. It appears to vibrate with a frequency of maybe once a day or twice a day between waking and sleeping. These are actually aspects of the intellect, attributes of the intellect, the mind, and senses, not the self. But because the self is pure, it assumes the characteristics of whatever it illuminates, or at least it seems to. Actually, it doesn't, but it appears that way because of our identification of the self with these other objects. I mean, these are the kind of thoughts that even though they kind of go round and around in a circle, are necessary to consider and contemplate every day as much as possible because they lead to, as I described, being able to discriminate between the self and everything else. And discriminating the self and knowing it apart from all of its limiting adjuncts is really the essence of self-realization. Therefore, this knowledge, even though it's part of the relative world, <laughs> even though, you know, scriptures have to be written on paper or, you know, distributed in electronic format or whatever, and they're material things, yeah. And the knowledge is also material because it resides in the mind and is used by the intelligence. Yet, this knowledge of Advaita, this Aupanishadic knowledge, is the 
main support of liberation, of enlightenment, of moksha, deliverance, freedom, coming to rest in the real nature of the self, which is Turiya. So one should hear these things regularly. One should think over and contemplate these ideas regularly on a daily basis. Read the scriptures, read the Upanishads, because they are the source of this great knowledge. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>